Okay, guys, welcome back. Um, you all have a nice spring break. Just like I haven't talked to you guys in forever, which is sort of true. Because we were on break, and I wasn't. Um, so this week is a bit of a, a jumbled week. Um, although it is technically week eight, the way the class is structured, we effectively have to kind of cram two weeks of material uh, into one week. It doesn't really mean that much more work for you, except when you get to the discussion boards. Uh, otherwise, it's pretty much the same amount of readings, just a bit more kind of uh, concise, condensed. So uh, let's first start with the midterm. The midterm has been available for more than a week. We have until the end of this week uh, to turn it in. Please remember, I cannot reset exams once they've been taken. So uh, be very careful when doing so. Make sure you give yourself enough time to finish the exam when you take the exam. Make sure that you have sort of your, your, your desk cleared, so to speak, you can immediately get to the exam and not kind of have to uh, be stressing about, you know, having to pick it up in half an hour or something like that. You need the time to do it, so make sure you give yourself the time to do it. Um, there's 50 questions. Uh, almost all of them are questions drawn from the quizzes. There's only a few new questions. The questions themselves actually are, um, I made about 400 total questions, of which uh, most of them are recycled quiz questions. But they are randomized, so that means you and a classmate uh, if you not compare notes, and they probably not have many of the same questions again. Okay, so let's get to this week's readings. We have the progressive action, and this is a reading mostly about the progressives. And the progressive, and it's trying to answer the questions here, who are the progressives and what are they trying to accomplish? The progressives are kind of the political active wing of these different reform movements. And there's several different reform movements that kind of fit into who the progressives are. So there, there's things like um, two weeks ago we, we did our assignment on Jacob Rees. There's, a, there's people like Jacob Rees who are kind of drawing attention to the urban poor. They kind of fit under the progressive movement. There's people like Upton Sinclair who was drawing attention to the um, the health standards of meat processing. Actually, he's trying to draw attention to the workers. That's sort of not how his writing was interpreted. Um, but same thing, that kind of fits under the um, progressives. Also, um, things like the women's suffrage movement and things like prohibition uh, could also fit under the progressive wing. Now, the progressive wing was at its most extreme, you know, anti-capitalist and socialist, and at its less extreme, it was sort of a um, market solution to the issues of, of society at the time. So the progressives kind of had their high watermark with the election of Theodore Roosevelt. Theodore Roosevelt was a Republican, and... He was not the first Republican president, but, but one of the more successful ones. And he was the progressive president. And a lot of his um, administration was focused on his support for these progressive reforms. Another aspect of his administration was breaking up trusts. Um, and a trust is essentially a monopoly where you have a company that's grown so big it not only is it too big to fail, uh, but it's too big for any meaningful competition to challenge it, which is then, you know, once you kind of corner the market, you can charge whatever you want, and that's sort of what a trust is. Um, strangely, there was also a kind of alliance between socialists and populists and Theodore Roosevelt, um, because he embraced a lot of their policies without embracing their politics. Um, so it's important to kind of understand that the theater is kind of the high watermark of the progressive movement. Um, it's, it's, it's a progressive president. He was a modern president in a lot of ways. 
he understood the use of his image, his personal image, as a means to communicate his agenda to the American people. Um, so he was one of the first presidents to be filmed, but the first president to use film in an effective way. So it's important to understand that not only does he represent this progressive movement, he also represents um, things like modernity. And the connection between progressivism and modernity is definitely there. So here we have, um, I talk a little bit about some of these, these reformers. I talk about Upton Sinclair, uh, Ida Tarbell, um, they talk about Lewis Hine, uh, all sorts of, of kind of different people who contributed to the progressive movement and had different sort of agendas which they were trying to further, but they all kind of fell into the progressive agenda. Um, here we have socialism. Socialism was rising as a uh, an accepted political practice. Um, here we have, uh, they talk about the 1912 election, and the 1912 election um, it, you know, is at the high point of the progressive era, uh, and this kind of talks about why that election was so so different and so important in this sort of uh, transitionary period between the, the pre-modern world and modernity in American society. So it's 1912 election, which if you don't know is very interesting because uh, Roosevelt had been president for two terms and had resigned, and he had handed the presidency off to his chosen successor. Taft, who succeeded in being elected. Um, and on the Democratic side, there was Woodrow Wilson, who was also a progressive, although in some ways less of one, more of a traditionalist who embraced some elements of the progressive agenda. And then you also had Eugene Debs, who was a socialist. So you had this kind of uh, four-way election, maybe three-way if you leave out Debs, although he did capture 6% of the vote, which is quite high for a third-party candidate. And Roosevelt and Taft split the Republican vote, which allowed for Wilson to be elected. Um, then we talk about the progressive amendments. Um, so this, this, the, the 17th, 18th, 19th, and 20th Amendment are considered the progressive amendments. The 17th Amendment ends the old system of choosing Senators, which used to be uh, done not by direct election, but by the state legislature, and that made it so that the senators would be directly elected. Um, other reforms would be uh, the 19th Amendment, which um, gave women the right to vote, and the 20th Amendment, which uh, outlawed alcohol which outlawed alcohol and gave rise to prohibition. And prohibition was, in many ways, a progressive movement. It was also very much linked to the women's suffrage movement because a lot of the women believed that alcohol was this sort of evil in society that was influencing the men to you know, perform uh, evil deeds, essentially, uh, you know, stay out drinking and spending their money and, and that sort of thing and not support their families. So the women's suffrage movement was very much tied to the prohibition movement, um, and they both managed to pass. Um, however, the progressive movement was not entirely successful. It was in many ways frustrated by the, although the politics had changed, in a lot of ways the mindsets of people in those days had changed. And uh, racism was still evident in American society, and racism frustrated some of the more progressive reformers in the changes they were trying to make in society. Um, we also talk about the progressive movement and its connections to World War I, which is more deep than you might expect. And we also talk about federal income tax, um, which is, uh, in many ways, you know, I think of it as progressive because it's a progressive tax. So this little video here is about the uh, Spanish War and the Spanish-American War, and you might think, again, it's strange to have progressives uh, connected to war, but progressives had this idea that they could change society, even if that was through sort of a foreign invasion 
of another country or foreign or intervention in a foreign country's affairs. So in many ways, the progressive movement was tied into this idea that America could be the kind of global policeman, that America could um, use its military might to enforce its will upon the kind of rest of the world. So this reading is about the progressive era and all the different aspects of it. It's a bit, you know, as I kind of warned you at the beginning of the video, it's a bit full. Uh, all of these readings are a bit full because we're trying to essentially cover two weeks' worth of information in one week. So this reading has this reading, which is, you know, 10 or 15 minutes long, uh, and it also has this these two videos, one of which is two minutes, the other one is a little bit less so. Um, these are all considered part of this reading. Okay. So then we get to the other reading for this, and this is the Great Migration. And this is one of those readings that you guys have told me you're not so fond of, these so-called topical essays. And this one's on the Great Migration. Um, the Great Migration is very important because it is the, um, the movement of people uh, to America and the movement of people in some parts of America to other parts of America. So this, this reading talks about foreign immigration. Um, and it talks about the settlement of the West, and it talks about the different ethnicities of people that were coming to America. Um, it also talks uh, later in this, I forget which slide it begins in, um, it talks about the Irish, of course. Um, it also talks about uh, the, I I this somewhere, it talks about the, um, let's see right there. It, uh, anyway, it's in there. It talks about the, the other part of the Great Migration, which is people moving in America to other parts of America, uh, which is a secondary part of the Great Migration. And then, of course, there's the quiz on these two readings. Uh, so that's the kind of main readings, and then we kind of get into the um, activities, which there are two this week. So if you go over to the... Um, Discussion board here. Let's see, let's see where we are. Uh, you go over to the discussion board, you see corresponding weeks of readings. Uh, I still have to grade week seven discussion boards. Um, and then we have the week eight, nine discussion board. And you notice that there are two. Where usually there were one, now there are two. And the reason for this is because we effectively have to cover two weeks with discussions. So you must do both to receive full credit. Doing one would not be enough. So just make sure you, you do make a comment and follow up comments for both. Okay. Now, um, over to the, uh, it's in the messages, sorry, not the announcements, so I'll put it in the messages. But I sent you a message. Uh, uh, get that part. That's uh, that's not you guys. You guys didn't get a message. Uh, so never mind. That's uh, that's something else entirely. So just make sure you are doing the. I know this video is a bit meandering, um, but hopefully you're getting all the information you need there. But just make sure you are doing both parts of the discussion board, and you're doing all of the kind of different groups. Uh, different parts of the, the readings, both readings for week 8, 9, and the quiz, and also the different activities and the discussion boards attached to them. So that's it for this week, and I will see you guys next week.